it is such a pleasure to welcome our loyal friend and one of America's clearest and best thinkers, John Labutli A., who uh, every week uh, John discusses the important issues on political insiders with his colleagues Pat Cadell and Doug Schoen. John, of course, on the Fox News Channel, Sunday evenings at 7.30. As I've been telling you all morning long, John is in Southeast Asia, and and it is such a pleasure to have you with us this morning, especially. Thank you, Phil. I am here in Bangkok, Thailand, on my way tomorrow. Maybe today, actually, because today is Saturday, but let's say it's Friday still. So I'm going to be going up to Laos tomorrow for my fourth trip this month. I mean, not this month, this year. And... uh, Hopefully, we're getting somewhere. Now, as a former congressman from New York, you have been a long time POWMIA advocate. And today is uh, proclaimed by the president National POWMIA Recognition Day. Uh, again, I've been mentioning uh, this all morning long, John. What can you tell us about your mission there? What are you doing there and why? Well, first of all, uh, it is P- National POWMIA Re- Recognition Day. It's coincidental, actually, that I happen to be on this trip during that day, but it's symbolic because I am hunting for live POWs with people in Laos who have been helping me, and uh, I've been on this issue since 1981. I know and it. So it's a long go, but uh, I believe they're there. I believe that um, they can be gotten, and I believe our own government is completely corrupt when it comes to this issue. How so? And this is not a partisan thing. I mean, I'm not blaming any particular president. They're all uh, incapable of getting to the bottom of this thing. It's a gigantic cover-up by the CIA, the DIA, the Pentagon, our intelligence agencies. It's a terrible situation, this thing. And why is that so? You know, I think it's because the original cover-up began when Nixon was going down the drain during Watergate. That I know for sure is is (coughs) when the POWs came home in 73, And they're famous ones like John McCain and Jim Stockdale and Richard Stratton and Everett Alvarez and so many of them. Uh, Everyone thought, okay, that's it. The issue's over. Great. All the prisoners are back. And then they quickly realized that they only had gotten half the prisoners back, that the Vietnamese had kept the other half, the other 600, as insurance against the money that Nixon promised to pay. Oh, my God. The only problem was we never did pay. And we still haven't paid. And they've never let the other prisoners go. And so Nixon, I think Nixon, I knew Nixon a little bit later in life. He he helped me on this issue. And Nixon would have brought the prisoner. He would have gone back and, and done anything to get the prisoners back. Except he couldn't because he was just months away from resigning. He was very weak as a president, power-wise. He didn't. He couldn't get them back. Right. So um, instead, they just said there are no prisoners. Unbelievable. And that line, there are no prisoners, stayed that way ever since, and and nothing has ever been done about it. And the guy that. Nixon leaves, Ford takes over as president, and puts in from Congress an old buddy of his to be head of the CIA in 76, uh, George H.W. Bush. Mm -hmm. And Bush is sort of given the job of keeping the lid on this thing. And that cover-up, which sort of began back then, has stayed intact ever since. And I have run up against it time after time, incredibly evil American government employees in Hanoi, in Washington, in Laos. I've I've been all over the world on this thing, and it has gone on and on, and it's a disaster. 
John, why can't the president step in? Is it because the system is broken? Is it because he doesn't have the power to pay off uh, whatever debt we owe? What What is the problem here? Well, no, a president has the power. The, the problem is a president, and I'm trying not to say Obama because he's got nothing to do with this issue. I certainly don't blame him. <clears throat> he was a child when this war ended. He doesn't have any background or knowledge uh, or any culpability in the issue. Right. But in order for him to do it, for any president to do it, here's what they'd have to do. They'd have to tell the bureaucracy, tell the CIA and the Pentagon and all the rest of them, there are a lot, there are a lot of agencies, um, intelligence agencies. You have to take them all on and tell them, I want the truth. And I don't care who's going to uh, get in trouble. I don't care that all the other presidents, both Democrat and Republican, will be hurt by it. I don't care that every president, every big shot secretary of state. I mean, this thing has so much blood on it, Phil, that it will hurt every political entity in our country over the last 40 years, beginning with Nixon. Yeah. And Ford and Carter and Reagan and the Bushes and Bill Clinton, all of them presided over the abandonment and the cover-up of these prisoners, whether they actually knew about it or not. Mm -hmm. They were the commanders-in-chief and the, the top government officials. If nothing was done, they ultimately have responsibility for it. Yep. So I, that, that's why I think they all just say, oh, God, why take this bear on? Let's just leave it alone, wait a little longer. All the prisoners will be dead from old age, and then we can just move on. Wow. What are you doing in terms of hunting for these uh, prisoners, these uh, missing in action troops? What are you doing? What do you mean by you're hunting for them, John? I'm not hunting in the sense of no, no. hunting. I I am in touch and being – I've been invited. I am a guest of the Lao government. Oh. So I am being dealt with on this issue very properly and responsibly, and I'm very happy with the way I'm being treated. And I don't think we'll get into too much of the details because let's just let it happen right. first, and then we'll see where it's at. But sure. it, it's – I'm over here for a good reason. I'm not doing the TV this Sunday night, which I don't give up lightly because I like doing the show. I know. But I feel this is obviously more important, and I wouldn't do it unless I felt that there was progress being made. The American Legion has uh, has been committed. Uh, is it uh, more than just that? Do we need more advocacy here? How can we help out? Well, I mean, there hasn't been anything for this issue. There's no advocacy. There's no – the American Legion hasn't done squat. For they haven't. Years. Wow. Nor, no, no. Nor has the VFW. The national news media is a disgrace. Mm -hmm. I mean, where is the story about the POWs left behind in Vietnam and Laos? There is no story. It's never in the news, never on the news at night. I never read a word about it. Yeah. Anybody like me who ever brings it up, with the exception of a couple of hosts like you, uh, to all the others, we're like, might as well be talking about UFOs or Elvis sightings. <laughs> so sad. And, and, and these are American soldiers yeah. who were fighting for their country that were captured and left behind deliberately by the United States government. And why the news media has ignored this story, I'll never understand. It, the, to me, this is the hugest story. Of course. It's the biggest cover-up in American political history, and the media just dropped the ball. Over 83,193 Americans are still missing or unaccounted for. This is complete. I mean, it's beyond my mind to think that it's that large a number and nobody is doing anything except for people like you, John. Yeah, well, uh, that's the way it's been for quite a while. And I think I told you how I first got into this issue. Um, 
Well, as I think about it a lot, I, I got elected to Congress and I got put on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I was the youngest <clears throat> member of Congress. I was 27 years old. And one of the first hearings the Foreign Affairs Committee was having was going to be on the Iranian hostage crisis, which had just come to an end a month earlier. This is now February 81. Hostages came home in January. This is February, and I'm sitting there at 10 a.m. in my seat in the front row of that two-decked hearing room. The senior members of Congress are in the higher back row, and the younger ones are in the front row. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there waiting, and I overhear two senior Republican congressmen behind me. One of them was a guy named Tennyson Geyer from Ohio. And one of them says to the other one, that was some briefing we had on the prisoners in Laos last night in the Pentagon. Hmm. And the other guy says something. And I listen for a minute, and I stand up, turn around, and say, excuse me, can I have that briefing? And they chuckled. They said, son, you are a member of Congress. You've got everything you want. Just call the Pentagon up, and they'll take you over there. So another freshman congressman and I, uh, Billy Hendon from North Carolina, we called up. We got the briefing set up. We went over there and had about an hour and a half given by an Admiral Kennedy. His name is Admiral Kennedy and two or three other personnel. <clears throat> and if you or your listeners had the same hour and a half briefing that we had, you'd be just as on to this as I have been, because they made it very clear. There were hundreds of POWs still being held right then, they showed us aerial photographs beginning three months earlier of a camp being built in a place in Laos called Namarath, where the first picture, which was like January, uh, excuse me, it was like December 1980, what you saw was all jungle. Then a month later, cleared out of the jungle were roads and a clearing. And then about two weeks later, structures were being built and fences had been put up. And then one month later, right when we were doing the briefing, they had the camp was activated and they even played us radio intercepts of the Lao military saying, we are moving the American prisoners south. It was right in the transcript of the uh, radio intercept. Right. So there was, there was no doubt what this was going on. This was a camp of American prisoners being held there. And uh, Hendel and I walked out of that briefing stunned and determined that we were going to get on to this thing. And wow. we both been, we are still on it 33 years later. Unbelievable. And this all, well, from what I read, uh, you also got involved while you were still at Harvard, uh, raising uh, campaign monies for a former Vietnam POW, yep. Leo Thorsness. Was that? The, a, that well, that, that's correct. I did, because I, I always cared about POWs, but wow. I didn't know. When I worked for Leo in 73 and 4, he was running for the U.S. Senate as a Republican in South Dakota against George McGovern. Wow. And the reason he did it was when he was a prisoner in North Vietnam, he was a pilot shot down in 67. Yeah. And he was held for the six years. And while they held him, Phil, they tortured him like they did a lot of these guys, including in Leo's case. They stripped all his clothes off him and hung him upside down on a wall for 10 days oh and played. They piped into the cell that, that he was hanging in uh, George McGovern's campaign speeches. And Thorsus was lying there going to the bathroom all over himself and everything. And he said, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to go run against that guy. And sure enough, he got out, came home, and started running for the U.S. Senate. I heard about it as a freshman at Harvard. And to make a long story short, I called him up, volunteered to help him, started raising money. At 20 years old, I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't know how to do anything. But I learned how to do it. And I moved out to South Dakota in the summer of 74 yeah. for the summer and worked for him. We lost, but that was my 
beginning of politics and very big on the POW thing. But I didn't know then that there were still other prisoners held behind. Right. That I didn't know Right. <clears throat> until I had that briefing in the Pentagon. And folks, if you're wondering why uh, John <clears throat> Leboutlier is talking about POW uh, MIAs, he is in Laos as we speak. And uh, this being recognized. No, no, I'm still in Bangkok. Oh, you're in Bangkok. I'm in Bangkok, Thailand. I'm going, oh, okay. I'm going into Laos within 12 hours. Yeah. Okay. Well, by the way, what time is it there? <laughs> what, what day is it? <laughs> uh, it's 11.50 at night. Oh, my so, God. So. On what bad. day? What, what, what day? Uh, we're early Saturday morning. No, no, no. It's late Friday night. So it's gotcha. It's eleven hours ahead of you. Okay. So you're twelve fifty yep. p.m. Add eleven hours on. That's eleven fifty at night, Friday night mm-hmm. here in Bangkok and in Laos. Have the families of uh, these uh, soldiers missing or unaccounted for? Have they been helping you? Have you been in touch with them, John? Tell us uh, that that side of the emotional story of, uh, you know, this goes beyond uh, words. And uh, tell us about that. Right. Well, many of I know I know a lot of the families that are mostly wives, few children. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one in the Boston area. I've sort of gotten out of touch with her lately, but she's a great lady called Barbara Mullen Keenan, whose husband was a Marine pilot in Vietnam, shot down and lost and in the mid 80s i took barbara with a couple of other people <coughs> she was the only family member and we went and had a meeting with bill casey the then head of the cia who was a friend of mine <coughs> i was out of congress but i was already hot to trot on this issue and we went in there and we had a big meeting in the in the director of the cia's conference room about the pow thing And it was really an embarrassment, Phil. When all was said and done, it was clear that we were getting the runaround. But there were two guys sitting next to Bill Casey who handed their business cards to Barbara and said, we will help you on your husband's case. Here are our cards. We'll get whatever info we can. You can always call us and we'll help you out. So she thought that was great. Right. So the meeting went on. We didn't get anywhere with the meeting except to learn that they were obfuscating about the issue and all that. And uh, I I even give you an instance. Uh, During the meeting, I looked at this one guy. Bill Casey says, this is my Lao expert, you know, Joe Smith, whatever his name was. So I looked at this guy and said, really? I said, can you tell me who is the president of Laos? (laughs) Guy had no clue. (laughs) I said, who's the vice president of Laos? No clue. I said, who's the foreign minister of Laos? No clue. The the so-called Lao expert didn't know anything. Uh, Nothing. So the meeting's over. We all say goodbye. We all go back. Barbara goes home to Boston. I go back to New York. She calls me up a couple of days later, and she said, you won't believe what happened. I took the business cards of these two guys that met us at the meeting and called them up to get the information on my husband's case. And I get the switchboard at the CIA, and I give them the name. Can I please speak to, you know, yeah. Agent Joe Smith, whatever. Right. And they pause. They come back and say, no such person oh, works here. Jesus. Oh, my So they had God. given her a fake oh. name. Whoa. And so she never could find these people. They <sighs> deliberately did that to her. Oh, my God. Uh, just the runaround is just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yet, you know, despite all this, the, the POW MIA flag still still is flying uh, over the White House, right? It, 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 yeah, I don't know. It's a law about it. It's on post offices, government buildings. I notice yeah. all the baseball stadiums. It's flying there. Mm. I guess it's great that it flies, although what good does it do? It's not bringing home any POWs. It maybe makes you feel good. Oh, yeah, there's the flag we haven't forgotten. Right, right. Well, if I were one of these men, if I were one of these men sitting in a Vietnamese prison camp, I'd say, the hell with the flags, folks. Come over here and get me out. I want to come home and spend the rest of my life free, alive, in my country. Yep. 
not to have you feel good about yourselves by looking at a flag. John, it's so interesting that you are there, what you're doing, because just yesterday when I was chatting with somebody about you, uh, the gentleman said, oh, oh th there's no uh, real evidence that really proves that, uh, 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 that the Americans are, are still there in captivity. And I said, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. But this is the propaganda that they fed us, and so many people believe it. There is so much evidence. Uh, there is, there are satellite and aerial photography of prisoners' escape and evasion codes put in the ground on rooftops in rice paddies. Uh, an escape and evasion code is a code that each soldier is given, or at least each pilot and airman is given. Not sure about infantry, but. Uh, there are numerous cases of this where the guy puts his unique symbol down. It's like your PIN code for your ATM machine. Right. You have a PIN that only you have, right? And each pilot has one. And there have been all these cases where they've drawn them in the ground so that a passing airplane or satellite can spot it. And the U.S. government has indeed photographed these things. And then what, what have they done? They just deny it. They hide the pictures. They deny that they're symbols. Oh, they say in one case, that's naturally occurring vegetation. Uh, oh, really? With, with letters and numbers in it. Um, I went to a place in April uh, on the Lao-Vietnamese border where there's a beautiful area, by the way, beautiful mountains, and in the middle are valleys with rice paddies and and communities living in there. And in one rice paddy, famously 25 years ago, they drew, a, a pilot drew 37 feet wide, USA, and underneath it, he had a thing called a walking K, which is the letter K, and the, their little feet on the bottom of the K, so that it looks like it's walking, and that's his unique escape and evasion code right. and that thing was drawn in the ground i think it was early 90s and finally brought to light years later and people are shocked and you know what one of the main debunkers of this piece what? of evidence is what? none other than john mccain who has been about the worst person on this issue as he is on most issues by the way uh he says oh no 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 that's not uh, anything important. That was drawn in the ground by a 12-year-old Laotian boy. Oh, God. Come on. Now, Phil, I ask you, why would a 12-year-old boy, first of all, how would he even know right. what an escape and evasion code is? And then yep. why would he go out in a rice paddy over mm. many weeks and draw this gigantic 37 feet high USA walking K. Yeah. For what reason would he do it? Yeah. You know, I mean, this is the stuff that's going on. Yeah. And I long yeah. ago, long ago, long ago, I gave up on the U.S. government forever getting to the bottom of a scandal that they themselves created. It's not going to happen. The government is corrupt, riddled with corruption and self interest. And I, I've moved on. Oh, I'm sorry. God bless you from all of our hearts. God's blessings surround you with what you are doing. John, you have no idea how much we absolutely take you in our hearts and are behind you with all of your efforts. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate it. So I'll talk to you in a week from somewhere. <laughs> Know that we are, are there with you in spirit, and thank you for joining us. It means so much to us. Thank you, John. Safe journey. All right, Phil. Have a good, happy POWMIA Recognition Day. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Watch the show without me on Sunday night, and I'll talk to you, I hope, next Friday as usual. Great. Thank you, John. Okay. God bless bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.